This is Twit. Tech Break is brought to you by ACI Learning. Keep your team's IT skills current. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit. Twit listeners will receive at least 20% off or as much as 65% off an IT Pro Enterprise Solution Plan. The discounts based on the size of your team when you fill out their form. Today we have Dev Rishi. He's co-founder and CEO of Predabase. Welcome to the show, Dev. Thanks very much, Lee. Really happy to be here. We're excited to have you here. We, we talk about some fun topics today, but before we get to all that, our audience is a huge spectrum of experiences, whether they're starting out or all the way up to the CEOs and CTOs of the world. And some of them love to hear people's origin stories. Can you take us through a journey through tech and what brought you to Predabase? Yeah, definitely. I know Brian asked me to uh, keep it concise. I'm going to do my best. Um, but, you know, my background actually started studying computer science and machine learning right in school over a decade ago. Um, I did my master's focused on computer science and statistics. Uh, and then I like to say that I sold out from my engineering background, and became a product manager. Uh, and so I became a PM at Google across a number of different teams. And I saw experiences of how Google research productionized machine learning inside of our products like the Google Assistant. Um, and then ultimately I actually spent most of my time on Google Cloud's external machine learning pro platform. Today it's called Vertex AI. At the time we were trying to figure out the name for it. Um, while I was there, I was also the first PM for Kaggle, um, which is a data science and machine learning community. If you're not familiar with Kaggle, when I joined you know, a number of years ago, we were just about a million users in the community, which was amazing to me because I didn't know there were a million people out there that knew the first thing about data science, machine learning, statistics, Python, pandas. But it turned out that was, you know, that was the case. By the time I left about two and a half, three years ago, um, we were over 5 million users. And today it's actually about 14 million which I think is just kind of, uh, you know, just speaks towards the growth of interest at kind of this individual level and being able to use ML. And so I saw that on the community side at the same time that I was at GCP seeing organizations struggle to actually put machine learning in production. And it was, um, you know, this dichotomy of a lot of interest in ML without a lot of the ability for organizations to production, uh, productionize and operationalize it outside of the Silicon Valley tech companies. And so in, uh, uh, 2020, I met my co-founders, Piero, Travis, and Chris. We were all excited about this new way to make machine learning more accessible to organizations. It was built on top of an open source project one of my co-founders had authored. So, you know, we started Predabase as a company to make it easier for engineers to build models um, about two and a half years ago. And we're, you know, we're excited to be uh, on that mission today. Fantastic. Now, with any ease of, of, of kind of developing things, obviously, people sometimes have us take a step back. They're worried about things and what's going to happen once you move it from a testing environment, experimentation environment into production. What are you, what are you seeing? What are you seeing some of the organizations out there or even developers out there once they start on a product like Predabase or any other product that's using you know, new technologies like some of the generative technologies that are out there? What's their reservations? What, what are, what's preventing them from moving forward? Definitely. So we actually did a survey to better understand this uh, recently. We surveyed about 150 uh, professionals that were either data scientists, execs, or engineers um, at their companies. And this was across U.S. tech companies, healthcare, financial services, and others. And one of the really surprising things to me was th there was a two-part thing that was actually surprising. One of them was how strong the interest was in LLMs and AI. Out of all the companies that we surveyed, 85% of them said they either already were experimenting with large language models or that they had immediate plans to do so inside the next 12 months to be able to start kicking off a work stream on this. Only 15% said that they didn't have immediate plans. At the same time, only 13% of the ones that we surveyed actually had a single large language model in production. And so I think we've seen this just incredible dichotomy between the level of interest and the fact that people are starting to experiment with them today and the fact that, you know, how difficult it can be to get into production. Now, we tried to understand what were some of the blockers, and I think you've heard some of them in the past, right? The LLMs hallucinate, they say things that we might not have expected. But the most surprising one was, at least in our survey, uh, three quarters of the organizations we surveyed said they just couldn't use commercial LLMs, the walled gardens behind something like an open AI API or any of these foundation model APIs. And so to me, that was actually one of the most fascinating results of the work that we did. Now, let me ask you a question. When you say they couldn't use them, is it because it's compliance reasons? Is it because the data is too sensitive? They don't want to they want to move it outside their private boundaries. What, what is it? The main reason that you're hearing? The number one reason that we heard was privacy. 
Um, and it's funny, you know, that privacy really, I think if you dive deeper and start to speak to some of these organizations means two things. The first means their data province and government. So what do you mean my data is going to go outside of my firewalls or outside of my VPC to some you know, third party API? But the second is actually ownership, which is I think if companies actually believe, which a lot of the organizations that we speak with do, that these models are ultimately going to be their IP, their competitive differentiation and advantage, then they need some ownership over the models that they're actually you know, going to be relying on. Um, they they don't trust this idea of weights and models being hidden away externally, you know, instead of uh, being something that they have direct access to. And so this idea of, you know, privacy was the number one sided reason, but I really think that goes hand in hand with ownership. To me, this is very similar to what we saw in, like, you know, some of the early stages of cloud adoption too in 2006, where we saw the staying power of these types of concerns across organizations and the need to be able to own some of this uh, and, and have that agency in house. Now we, we had Salesforce on in previous weeks and they obviously they talked about, you know, all the millions of different AI models and so on that they're putting into production. And, but the problem is they're not seeing fast adoption. Um, and the, the one thing is obviously privacy issues. How do you see organizations looking beyond this? Like what, what do they have to get over uh, or what do they have to do to, to kind of feel better about this? Yeah. The really nice thing is that, you know, the history of machine learning is already in part, uh, been really kind of well, uh, well versed in how to be able to solve this problem. So uh, I think that the main thing organizations need to be able to do is be kind of uh, more oriented around open source and ownership. The reason I think those two things go hand in hand is I think more and more organizations are going to realize that using a really large external commercial LLM, like something like Cheap T4 or others that um, customers might be integrating in today, it's kind of like using a cannon when you need a scalpel. And instead, what you really need are much smaller, fine tuned large language models that you actually host internally inside of your VPC. Today, the difficulty with any organization who wanted to, you know, host a, a very large language model, 175 billion parameters or even larger, like the ones that GPT-3 and R on are, are just getting the actual GPU compute to be able to host that is something that will be really expensive and cost prohibitive. And candidly, good luck getting access to the A100s uh, in order to be able to actually even do that. And so what I think, you know, organizations need to be able to shift their mental model to is I don't need a cannon to be able to solve all of these problems. For some of them, I need a scalpel. And that really means fine tuned open source large language models. We've seen things like BERT, which is like a 300 million parameter model. So many orders of magnitude smaller be really the workhorse of natural language tasks and enterprise organizations in the past. And this extends from 300 million to the recent Llama 2, 7 billion and 70 billion variants that Meta re uh, released as well. Um, and I think even OpenAI has spoken to how fine tuning smaller models is competitive or even better at solving specific tasks than a very general purpose model. My favorite quote from a customer just to wrap this is that, you know, I don't uh, general intelligence is great, but I don't need my point of sale system to recite French poetry. And so like being able to have something that's a little bit more task specific, I think is really where organizations right. will go. Uh, we talk a lot about how the, a lot of these generative technologies are kind of like little sideshows and people are impressed in the meantime, but they don't know how to commercialize them. And I think that's pretty interesting. Now I'm actually, I've talked to a lot of organizations, especially startups who are, you know, commercializing a lot of this. Um, and what I'm seeing, in fact, I talked to one um, that's in um, uh, the pharmacy uh, data analytics side where they actually, like you were saying, spin up VPCs, virtual private networks that have the infrastructure that can run and then they inject these models in there. And that that's where the it's basically their own wall garden around private data sets that come from other companies, pharma companies um, that they can then do the analytics on, produce the insights, give them that data. And then, of course, shut these networks down and basically delete all unknown you know, visibility into it. Is that the model? In, in, Similar to Predibase, is that the model you're seeing going forward in order to, for people to feel more secure and more happy that their data is not going anywhere that but but what they have control over? That's our model. And that's the only model that, you know, when we've spoken to customers, we get the head nod from the CIO in the room or anyone else who's reliant on compliance and privacy. So just to dissect that a little bit more, mm -hmm. what companies and platform providers, for example, like Predibase and us really provide in that world is the infrastructure that deploys inside your own virtual private cloud. 
is able to spin up any of the large language models that you want. And one of the benefits you get here is not just the privacy, but the ownership and choice. The platform like Predivase, you can spin up any open source model. If you want to use Llama 2, 70 billion, you can. If you want to use, you know, a different variant of these, you can. Uh, and you can experiment across them. So we provide the infrastructure, you spin that up, it's serverless. So it'll, you know, essentially run for the point at which it's being consumed, then turn down afterwards. And it just stays co-located where your data is. So if you're in AWS and you have your, you know, large language model spun up on a GPU cluster there, managed by a, like an a infrastructure provider like Predibase, you have your data in Redshift. Those things can be co-located so that there's kind of minimal friction in being able to use that directly. Uh, and you use that data integrated in your large language model. And we can talk about ways that you can customize an LLM to your data. There's a few techniques, but you can use that data for the analysis that you need and then spin down the service so it's not actually costing you any money or you know getting more exposure after you're done. So I wanted two more questions and then I want to bring my co-host back in here. Now, I think the first thing being is most AI machine learning has been cross, cross, cost prohibitive, meaning most companies can't afford to get started on it. And if they do, uh, you know, it ends up, you know, scaling exponentially for them and, and costing too much to maintain. What, what is, you know, what is kind of the getting started uh, cost for an organization? Is it is it low enough that people can start funneling a bunch of data in and seeing data insights right away and they just pay for compute? Or is it, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a subscription model and then you pay for data storage and all that stuff. Is there, what, what's the model follow? Yeah, that's a great question. And I really like it because I think that AI has been cost prohibitive for many organizations for two reasons. The first was, um, you know, the technical talent gap uh, in some regard, which is, do I need to hire a PhD? Uh, and then the second was the actual underlying infrastructure. Inside of our platform, what we're really looking for is, do you have what we call an ML curious engineer? So that's, that means two things. The first is, you know, an engineer who's willing to read technical documentation and get up to speed. Um, and that they have some interest essentially in being able to understand like how these ML systems get architected, but that's more or less it. From there, the only things that we really charge for are, um, you know, the actual underlying compute that you're using. Uh, and so like, at, you know, basically as, as you use more, that's kind of like how the consumption really gets driven. Uh, in terms of what that actually looks like for that engineer, our entire system is predicated around this idea of taking a declarative approach. A declarative approach means the engineer specifies the what and the system figures out the how. And so they use and specify their entire pipelines using these configurations, simple files that they can just extend over time. And the key idea behind that is that they can control what they want. They can specify the piece of the pipeline they want in a single line of config. And then all the rest of the boilerplate and all the rest of the adaptations that need to be done, you know, are filled in with our best practices. So that's how we've generally approached the platform. And, you know, um, we're actually built on top of open source foundations. And so if you wanted to see a few examples of how people like just can get started on this, Ludwig.ai is a great like initial source uh, for being able to allow engineers to onboard onto it immediately. Mm -hmm.